to to round off uh, today's speakers, uh, we have our final uh, final speaker here, Espen, who um, who will sort of uh, uh, let's see, give his sort of final thoughts and uh, on, on the day and uh, especially the the stone wall uh, section. And uh, as uh, you work him, uh, Lilia said he's been uh, he's been collaborating with Espen, uh, so so. Um, uh, I suspect that Espen will sort of uh, touch on to some bits that you were Kim uh, left out, and uh, yeah, uh, and what, the way we will do it here because Espen has a sort of shaky internet connection is that uh, uh, Kate Nickel will be sharing his presentation, and uh, we will just uh, and he'll have to tell Kate when to change uh, slides. Ooh, let's see here if. I'm just trying to find it myself. Do we have Kate, Kate has all the all the presentations, so she I has am to here. sift through them first. It's but do we have for some? some reason? We can hear you. Do you Would hear you me like now? to just speak? Yeah. I think your sound is so, good, and uh, I know that uh, it, before it was a little shaky, but then it's stable. My sound is good. So I think it's going to be all right. Especially when I turn off my video. Uh, good. Okay. I'm ready. Good, good. Let's see when Kate finds the. I'm nearly there. Yeah. How to read a stone wall. That's it. But the wrong one comes up. That's uh, rather profound. That <laughs> late today. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The name uh, of uh, of Espen's presentation is uh, "To Read a Stone Wall: Diversity Within Traditional Tradition and Local Variation." Here it is. Because right. yeah, we've learned for, both for biodiversity reasons and conservation reasons, we don't want to do it all the same way. We want to preserve the local variation, of course, and know about it. Of course. Yeah. Maybe you. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> we get there in the end. No. no. That's, oh, I'm sorry, it is there. We saw it, didn't we? We did. Okay, well, Espen, maybe you can present uh, yourself a little yeah. bit to start with. Who are you? Myself. My name is Espen Martinson. Um, I have been uh, working as, well, it says, in the presentation is the stonemason. That was only a part of it. It was also a lot of dry snow walling. And uh, I had my own restoration company, had it running for 25 years or so. Uh, but for the moment, I work for the Norwegian Defense Estate Agency in a section for cultural heritage. Uh, and uh, well, it's a lot of walls here too. Um, but about the working title, um, how to read a dry stone wall, uh, it's really too profound. Uh, I mean, so we should rather talk about uh, diversity with tradition, or maybe we should say uh, local variation. Are the slides running? No. I, no, not I hope yet. so. Oh, no. No. no we're not oh, seeing. dear. It is on my screen. Oh. So I'll try again. I think you just not, haven't shared it. I, yeah. You just didn't press share screen, I think. So that's um, just it. But anyway, um, my concern is exactly the, uh, the variation in the tradition. Uh, it's so huge, and as you will see from my presentation, it's some. Well, I have my opinion on how to preserve that variation in the right way, um, and it's maybe a little bit strange way of thinking it. But I think you also will recognize some points from the from the earlier speakers. Um, 
and I was planning to start with some claims of mine, as I always do. Can you see the screen now, Espen? No, just a green frame. Can everybody else uh, see it? We, we can, yes. So, uh, ah, sorry. Well, I have it. Uh, I have it printed here, so I can just go on then. Okay, good. Yeah, so and, just and tell just, me when uh, you want me to move on. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. Well, uh, these claims are mine um, because um, the way I was trained is all from like working by doing it, like uh, uh, dismantling and putting up walls and working together with traditional car, uh, craftsmen, as uh, Joachim told us about. Uh, and as I was um, getting more experience, I saw that the traditional working methods and materials, there are opportunities to work varied, research-friendly, and gentle. Gentle in the understanding of, uh, of working with a site of cultural interest, for example. And this opportunity becomes available when you have become such a good craftsman that you can exercise what I will say is discretion in your work. By discretion in this context, we can understand, maybe we could talk about improvisation or perhaps we can call it a planning deviation from my idle way of doing it. Um, you actually work with an understanding of what is good enough. I think that it will sum it up, I guess. And then again, to get to that uh, state of working, you first have to become so good that you master some simple but very basic techniques of dry snow walling which you have to learn to use in different scopes and details when working with culture heritage. And this, I think, was perfect showed by Kate from DSVA, uh, how they are trained in these um, skills I'm talking about, and I will show you later on. This means that you treat each wall on its own terms with all your knowledge, how can this wall tolerate the deficiencies without compromising its value in use? It can be very resource friendly and a good cultural heritage preservation when you can reuse the local material on the best possible way and restore a unique expression and adaption in a timeline for a given environment. So here I'm talking about restoration work, really. Um, and why I talk about this at this stage is that in Norway, we really have the situation where we, we, um, we tend to simplify the, 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 the historical sites because we start building too many walls after one way of doing it. We don't understand the different kind of materials. We don't understand the different uh, reasons for why the, the walls were built and so on. So this is very important for me, but these are my claims and they are open for discussion. But as I see it, if you go through these uh, steps, you will now be able to shape the walls you build or restore with thoughts and handcrafts they stand out because they adapt. You have contributed to preserving the diversity of dry stone walls in gardens and cultural landscapes without losing quality or value of use. So let's have a look at the basic in dry stone walling. Next uh, slide. So, um, 
in Norway, we often say that we drive some walling is about stacking stones, really. Um, but everybody who has been working for a while with drives and walling see that you well that that won't work in the long uh, long line. So you will be better off with these basic techniques by using runners, trues, passers, harting as the Scots will name it, or fillings. Using the batter, that will differ a lot. There was a question earlier on with uh, how the retaining wall should be battered. That is not one answer to that. You will always use wedges and there will be pinning in the face of the wall. So I, I really like this picture I have here. It's from the 30s, I think, on the west coast of Norway. And it's obviously some guys to have uh, they have decided to wall instead of stacking. Um, nice picture and nice attitude. Next slide. So, um, uh, after a while working in Norway with the Dryson wall, the, the work also brought me abroad to different countries in Europe, mostly, in the Eastern Europe, in Portugal, in the British Isles, uh, been to Shetland working. And I saw that the same, the techniques that I had learned at home was not any different from the new places I came to. So I will claim again that uh, we can talk about some universal techniques and they can shape your craft into two different directions. And maybe you have to go both of them, but uh, you shouldn't let them separate separate because using them as requirements in your own work it could lead you to simplification of expression very little variation and sometimes also unnecessarily costly but um, then we can see that that's not what has happened it has given a picture of great diversity of walls in all countries where dry stone walling has been carried out. So my claim from my own practical experience is uh, by applying the principles in your work, you get the opportunity to use a wide variety of materials and dimensions and a variation in the masonry detailing. You have become a mason with professional judgment, you can work at a point in a timeline of a cultural historical facility or environment. Next slide. That should be about function and construction. So here I will guide you through some of these basic techniques that I guess they also uh, we learn at the, the training in England. Uh, and I think also this different name of the, of, the, of the technical parts will be understandable for uh, uh, many of you. There should also be a glossary to this lecture so you can look it up there. But um, let's start with the, the, um, the face of the wall. It's made of runners and the true stone. And in Norway, it's not so common that the true stone is running from one face to another, as Kate explained us, that was more used in 
England. But in Norway, we recognize the true stone as the stone from the face of the wall that is connecting the face with the hearting. So you see, I have pointed out an example of that in that uh, drawing up to the right. And um, for the runners on the drawing further down, you have that, you can say that it's uh, made out of an ideal of how you built with bricks, one by two and two by one. So you have one runner crossing two stones underneath or, third st or um, even more stones than two. And it's all about breaking the joints, uh, as I guess you would say in England. <clears throat> because what you want to achieve with using runners and true stone is that the ball is not um, made of three separated parts. You want the two face, face, uh, face of the wall uh, connect with uh, the filling. So you have one complete uh, structure uh, that is actually the whole uh, width of the wall and the length of the wall um, working together. And as uh, Joachim mentioned, the, the meaning or the the importance of the fillings. I think it's rather nice put out by the Scots by calling it the hearting. And it's that's the same experience for me. When I was doing my training with the old guys, this was what they really were concerned about, the fillings. And doing the fillings right and using the, some of these basic uh, uh, techniques, you are able to build almost with any kind of stone. Another claim from my <laughs> point of view. Um, and then we also have the wedge. In Norway, we think wedge is a weak part of the wall. Um, many think that you should be able to build the wall without wedging. I would say that's that's not true. Uh, you will find wedge wedges used in all kind of traditional walls in one way or another, and they are perfectly put in the back of the stone, uh, where it's securely placed, uh, packed in with the stone and the hearting. Uh, and the picture here shows a bit about, um, oh, let's see. Here we have the picture as well. Uh, we have uh, a little bit further on, maybe, if Kate can do that. Well, you can look at the picture while I keep talking. Uh, anyway, we have uh, a similar picture on my uh, slide now, the function and construction slide, um, where you see the two faces of a double dike and you see the hearting in the middle and it's ready for you two, two new courses of the face is put out and it's ready to start working with the, the new hearting. Next slide, it's about more about runners and wedge and fit-ins. Okay. Um, I guess you see the right slide and not the same as I'm looking at. Um, can you change that even more? Kate? We have a screen that says runners yeah. and then wedge. Is that yeah. correct? No, we can. Yeah. What? Sorry, you have a. Runners on the left and wedge on the right. 
Ah, perfect. Thank you. So uh, we are done with the runners, uh, but we have what I call fit-ins or passers, maybe, is the right English word. I maybe need some help from Kate here. Uh, but you see from the drawing, it's a kind of a helping stones. When you are lack of good material for making good crossing of the joints, like putting in good runners, you can use these fittings to make the crossing of the joints better. So that's what I tried to show in the drawing. By putting in a fit in, you can um, uh, get a better crossing when you do the, the break of the joints. Uh, so that's that's the whole thing that that single stone is doing. It's not necessarily doing any true stone. It's necessarily not a, a runner, but it help the runners on both sides getting better runners. And you have the wedge, as we have already talked about. Very important. Uh, so important that when I did work at Drysnow Wall, that was... Uh, uh, I went to the quarry and I actually picked out stones, especially for this occasion, the wedge. It was not something I, by luck, was picking up from the site. I was actually in the quarry, taking it out, and of course also reused all that I could find in the dismantling. And they are very important that you don't put a lot of wedge under a stone. It should be only two or three at the back of the stone. Do you um, put too much stones underneath your face stone? You will have uh, it easily come unstable. So uh, that was about the basic. Now you can go out, start walling, I would say. Uh, but since this is about the gardens and and some well, some special sites like uh, uh, old pager land, maybe or uh, yeah, different. Then my experience is that also walls made with this variation, this this adaption to an environment using local stone also give a big value back to the site and the well the the environment itself at the site um, so can we talk about that a dry stone wall actually can give you or add an element of nature um uh, when it's, it's it, when it's constructed in the way that i was trained to do it after first becoming really good at this um basic techniques and how i then started to understand when i was um, when i really had to use the, the techniques and when i could actually put some of them aside and rather go for some easier uh, uh, solutions. And, you know, it's not possible. The wall you are looking at here, uh, it's a boat shed on the Isle of Rust in Lofoten. Uh, if, if a master craftsman in Kate's uh, training program um, I'm not sure if he would actually be able to build this boat shed because it's so it differs so much from from these basic techniques that I was also trained in. So it's like almost like a musician getting really good and then he can can start improvise uh, in a how in somehow. So. <clears throat> Um, and but at the same time, um, 
going around the corner of the house, the boat shed, on the next slide, you will actually see and recognize some of exactly the basic things that we are now have been talking about. You see the true stones. There are runners there. You can't see it from this angle, but there are. And you have wedges used for st stabilizing the single stone and the wall itself. So uh, next slide. I don't know if this is important in a historical garden. Um, I don't know enough about historical garden. I guess there is a big variation. But for example, these pictures we're looking at here, you have the stone garden at Finnese in Kabelvog up to the left there. Really simple retaining walls from the stone that was there or maybe uh, involved when they were actually planning or constructing the garden. You have the little cabin in the mountains of Virondana up to the right. It's, uh, it's made probably from stones just found in the, uh, on the, in the ground, like in a radius of 500 meters or so. You have the terraces down to the left in Havro Farm at Ustre, north of Bergen on the west coast. Terraces for uh, agriculture, uh, cultivating, and taken out from the ground and built for a certain purpose. And you have the fence also from the Isle of Rust out at the outermost part of Lofoten. Single dike made of stones from the, the cultivated land. So I think this is really important. Also important parts of historical gardens that we are able to also build simple structures, maybe not uh, standing out like perfect constructions, but they are stable. They give you a function and uh, they can be maintained in a very simple and resource friendly way. So um, finishing off, I think with uh, just talking about all this variation and how it can also be misunderstood maybe, or maybe we should uh, yeah, talk how to interpret the, the walls we are looking at. So if you take the next slide, I should um, finish this. Um, because we might misunderstand or interpret wrong when we don't know the original use or the original design of the wall. We mix perhaps decay with what is essentially a simplified detailing adapted to needs and the environment of efficient use of resources. And of course, also what we were talking about earlier with the Kate and uh, Joachim, uh, lack of maintenance. Uh, we don't know the so-claimed universal techniques and all lack of detailing is understood as weakness of the dry stone wall because we don't, we don't uh, recognize the techniques because they are random used or they are used with a material that is where they are not so easy to discover. In the following, we will try to use these point of views when we look at an old dry stone wall built as a fence for grazing cattle on the island of Jumfulan on the south coast of Norway. So you can uh, next slide, we can talk about the typology of dry stone wall. Espen, uh, you're basically out of time now. Do you have many yeah, slides just, left? No, it's, uh, I'm going to run it them quite fast, five minutes or so. 
Uh, that's that's a okay. bit much, to be honest, because we only have okay. 20 minutes. But uh, okay. if you want to still show picture the pictures, so to just... Uh... No, no, we can finish it. It's just uh, like uh, the the typology, because it's so uh, different in a right. stretch of uh, 200 meters. But uh, it's not uh -huh. uh, it's not important. But, but are, are there can... some more images coming up that we could look yeah, at? Yeah, there are images oh, on yeah. all of them. Because yeah. the, the, the point here is that the, we have a stretch of 200 meters of wall, and it's actually contain three different way oh. of constructing a fence. Uh -huh. So that's the thing. You have the double wall. Yeah, yeah we're seeing that wall. now. Yeah, Yeah, that's the one we see now. And the mm -hmm. next slide, Kate, is a single wall, single dike. Mm -hmm. Uh, and on this last one, we have what we call a one face wall with a stone mound. It's, I don't know if it's normal in other countries, but this is very normal in Norway. And I think all the, this theory talks about a lot of what I have been uh, going through now that we have to understand why it was built, yeah. what was the condition, how was the use of the land. And um, and then we have this uh, big variation just on actually a small stretch of a fence. And that is what I am really concerned about when I'm talking and working with uh, drives on wall. Yeah, to see the complexity and, uh, and, yeah. and, yeah, and not be formed into this one school of... Uh, how it's no, it's easily, it's easily to say that this is uh, damaged. Well, that was exactly what they did. They said that number right. two and number three was damaged uh, uh, images of the number one. That is more like a fence that everyone is recognizing as it's, a yeah. dry stone wall, double one. Right, it's intentional. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. That's actually, I think that's a very good... Um, that's a very good point, and I think it connects to in, in terms of like historic gardens. Uh, this has to do a little bit with how in garden history, uh, we garden conservation, we tend to work harder at preserving the the sort of history of the finer people, the the richer people, and and uh, their practices. And you know, we've got all historic gardens are often around castles or manor houses, and. And and these practices are, are more maybe belonging to another social class that yeah. is equally important to preserve, but it does not get the same recognition. So so this would be a, a, yeah dry stone wall conservation of, of working class uh, dry stone walls. Uh, would that be accurate? But it's also it's also about craftsmanship because yeah. as a craftsman, you will in the beginning you will like to do it as good as possible as uh, nice and neat and good as possible yeah but when you get more experienced and you know that you actually are capable of doing that but you can also do a wall with a simpler look and a simpler kind of construction and still say that this uh, uh, wall is good enough for this use yeah. and that's that was at that stage, that was when I actually thought that my work was important and uh, fun doing it. Hmm. Well, I so think it's the same doing... for a gardener. You start with like very a very formal idea of what, what it's supposed to look like. And then as you progress, you end up thinking nature does it best, basically. And, you, <laughs> yes. you know, it's, it's or like, you know, it, you, you sort of learn to appreciate uh, messiness as you progress yes. in, in a skill, I think. Exactly. Uh, yeah, with, with some control where it matters, and then you let the rest sort of be. Yeah. Lovely. Okay. Thank that you. That was very a much. very <laughs> good. That was a very good sum up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, <laughs> let's have um, uh, let's have some questions. So we have we have very little time here, and I'm I'm trying to sort of think about what's most important to to include. Uh, I'm thinking the poll, the quest answers to the polls, uh, we can actually sort of send out maybe afterwards because we are uh yeah basically out of time so so mercy has put it together and and you will uh, you will see those uh, we'll send them out instead i think and uh i think it would be nice to have at least one question per sort of speaker here uh, of the people who have been speaking after the last panel session uh and uh that would be uh starting with uh, ted i think okay 
Hello. And uh, Hello. so um, I, I know that, I mean, you, you specialize in slugs and snails. Uh, so for them, the limestone obviously is very important. But do you know that whether or not uh, for some for other uh, invertebrates, for example, uh, would a would a non alkaline rock be be favorable? Like, um, like, um, are are the granite stone walls just generally poor in diversity, or do you do we have some specialists in 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 that type of like yeah. rock as well? Yes, uh, they are well, for, for some groups they're poorer, but they are bolder habitats. And if you took the example, when I got from the macrocosmos into the microcosmos in the wall, it is almost most favorable. A, a stone wall is a refugium, and especially in a, a uniform agricultural landscape. Right. So I would say... Uh, no matter they, what, the, what they're no, made No of. matter. And, and I would say, thanks, uh, in Sweden, they are protected in the agricultural landscape and the churchyard walls as well. Yes. Because you, you cannot do any changes except uh, you got permission from the authorities. That's great. And uh, have you ever actively moved some species like like some, some snails to to other walls or, or rock habitats to, to sort of expand their, since they have such trouble moving themselves? Like, have, have you ever uh, been involved in projects like that? Uh, yes, not not directly with stone walls. Yes, a boulder habitat. I have done it. Yes, we have moved populations to save them because they were the area was going to be, be exploded for a tunnel. Yeah, and so it's very moved. fragile. If you if you only know yeah. that they exist in one place in a, in a region, you might want to sort of make sure they. Yes, yes, and and sometimes you could take the boulder themselves as they are attached to them. Yes, exactly. That's more yeah. to more care to the animals that make it more easy for them. Yeah, like you could graft graft some snails between different uh, cemetery walls yeah. or something. It'd yes, be interesting to see like a more active conservation technique. Um, now, uh, uh just uh, for um, let's see here for Friedrich. Um, I think I mean the applications for your uh, for your work in historical sites are just lovely. I mean, with the using all uh, the schematics to get the diggers to go exactly where they're supposed to, and uh, I mean, so I know you said you felt out of place, but ha have you worked in historic sites at all? Yeah, that would be as uh, the project I show you with the uh, Yota Canal and. Right. Uh, some foundation around the channel. Right. Uh, yeah, and we have been doing that for the channel company. So, uh, of course, they have a, a lot of restoration they have to do, and they have a lot of uh, <clears throat> um, rules of how to do it, which, which is great. And then we are uh, helping them with, document, with documentation before and after. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then I think that's great with just using the the new technology together with old old knowledge yes i mean this yeah. in a way i i think this uh helps people to be more to work in a more historically accurate way basically with the technology it, it really really does and the photogrammetry is when when we are working with like big retaining walls and stuff like that the photogrammetry is so really good today and it's so so good in detail so uh, that is a, a big um, uh, tool for uh, even if we don't know how to build the retaining wall we can help people doing that which have the, the skills to do that we can help them with the, the accurate data and put stuff where they were yeah and I have to say, when looking at the locks and the Jota Canal channel and all this old stuff that is millimeter accurate, it's so impressive. And if we, when we are working with this today, we have such big troubles. And then we stand there scanning these walls and the work they have done is so overwhelming. It's it's they knew perfect. what they were doing, basically. Yeah, they really, really did. Ah, that's interesting. Very impressive. It's 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 nice to, I mean, because you you can really prove that. Yeah, this is obviously like this was made by 
someone who really knew their skill and yeah yeah mm. yeah, yeah it's fantastic and how, how they have uh, as Joachim said the water is the biggest issue we have and looking at Jota Canal and, and the, where the locks are built they have a lot of water of course because it's it, it's yeah. water they are retaining yeah so uh, making them uh, looking at the channel and the special clay they are using which is from a special part in Sweden uh, they cannot use any soil and any, there has to be some special type of soil for making it uh, be uh, uh, I don't know the English word for it so it, it can't let water through and stuff like that so that's uh, it's impressive hmm. yeah that's cool um so I, I'm thinking uh I know there are some things that uh, need to uh, be said before we finish, and I, I, I'm thinking it might be good to do that now, and then if we have more time, we can have more more questions. Uh, so, uh, Joakim, perhaps uh, Joakim Seiler, would you like to show yourself here? Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah. Um... I could just give some information of upcoming uh, activities in the project. Uh, we are, I can share my screen yeah. just very for a short moment. Yeah, because we uh, want to see, I mean, now that people are enthusiastic, uh, what, what else can we learn and how, how can we, if we want to get into this, the, this these topics or other topics, what, what's go, going on, what's coming up? Yeah, so... Uh, the uh, as Jenny mentioned earlier today, we are working on a um, um, application for a, a upcoming course: dry stone walls construction, maintenance, and restoration. Um, so we are making this application this winter, and we hope uh, that we will uh, get granted to to um, do that uh, course. And it will be a course for for uh, professionals. Uh, in dry stone walling, and uh, so that's uh, we that's uh, possibility uh, for the future in uh, with this Swedish course. Um, but, but I have to say, you don't have to be yeah. professionally into dry stone walling when you apply. But you you need to work with something that's where dry stone walls occur, right? Like, yeah. like a like that's a gardener, a, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the kind of an introduction to the to to working with dry and it will be so, a couple a couple of weeks long. So it's, yeah, it's uh, about uh, ten weeks in, in total. Five weeks uh, theory uh, that you can do on your own, and and uh, five weeks uh, uh, together in uh, working in practice and learning the, the practical skills. Yeah. So that's just uh, something that we are working on right now, and it's. Uh, uh, Ali Nilsson uh, uh, was working on that application primarily um, and the site for this is Gunnebo and then we will have a workshop uh, um, which is connected to this so so today we have had the, the, the webinar uh, for pathways and dry stone walls and uh, um, we will um, also have uh, a practical workshop uh, in August uh, here at Gunnebo uh, House um, uh, next year. So um, August uh, 27th and 28th. And uh, we will have, we don't have um, the detailed program yet, but uh, we will have one day focusing on uh, pathways and one day focusing on dry stone walls and, and not just uh, discussing things, but also doing things. Uh, so so getting, uh, getting ourselves uh, uh, dirty together. Um, so welcome to apply for, for the upcoming workshop. And for those and, who are not familiar with this project, the, the whole project, uh, are, the, uh, are the workshops also free? Yeah, they are free. Yeah. Good. Uh, maybe you have to pay for, for, uh, for the food, um, but uh, not for the workshop um, um, otherwise. Right. And then uh, we have a final, uh, this winter, we have a final uh, webinar as well on the 16th of January. Uh, and it's uh, the theme is uh, ponds and fountains in historic gardens. So that's the final webinar. Uh, but you can also find 
all webinars have been recorded and also the, the uh, workshops in the project. So you can find all, uh, all the materials under uh, the results section of, on this uh, uh, website, gardenconservation.eu. Um, so that's where you can find a lot of material from this project. And the application for the workshop is not uh, opened yet, uh, I think. No, so no, it's... we have we have just decided the the dates and so 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 you have to uh, hold your horses just a, a while. But we will open the application quite soon. So, yeah, great. Um, well, we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, and that, but I think I just uh, I know it's not really a question, but I, I just uh, I think I I want to make this point uh, just based on the on on the last speaker that um, that it is important to to not forget uh, the 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 culture uh, cultural heritage of uh, of the poorer classes uh, as we as we go about our, this work. Uh, it tends to be a lot of. Uh, yeah, fine locations, but I I think this was um, and and I, I'm saying this because it's something that I might myself forget a lot. That you know, what did what did the farmers do? What 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 did uh, you know? Because it's just not romanticized enough in the same way that uh, the castle life is. Um, but also that um, that sort of peaking in your skill uh, can lead to a sort of control sloppiness I think is also a nice a nice uh, thing to to consider because uh, we also learned that complexity uh, leads to higher biodiversity so this type of sloppiness and allowing that is something that we know from also from previous webinars about you know hedges and meadows and lawns and everything is that a compl more complex uh, complex structures and complex landscape leads to higher biodiversity so we, uh, where it's possible, and maybe we should allow ourselves this type of sort of aesthetic sloppiness sometimes, not just for ourselves, but for the other other uh, creatures living in around us. Um, I don't know. We got uh, one minute left, so I think maybe we should round off. I know that we're more questions, but uh, um, you, you, I think you, you're probably welcome to contact any of the speakers afterwards if you want to get into this. I don't think they will be sad to hear that you're interested in what they're doing. So, so just feel free to reach out if you want to get into this more. And I hope that more gardeners have become more interested in, uh, in uh, taking a sort of closer look at their pathways and their historic pathways, like how they were built and where they were. And, uh, and on how to how to sort of make the best out of their dry stone walls. It's uh, I'm looking forward to 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 the future here. I think that uh, these topics are sort of on the rise, and uh, and we will see more more of it. At least I hope in Scandinavia where it's badly needed. And uh, it was nice to see how well the UK is doing in terms of dry stone walls. It's an inspiration. Um, yeah. So thank you all for this day. I'm uh, going to stop recording now uh, and uh, we sort of round off the webinar. And uh, if you want to share it with your friends, uh, as Joachim said, it's recorded, so you can just share the link later when it's been uploaded. Have a nice evening, everybody. Thank you, Jenny.